What's up, everyone? This is David, aka Reverse Long, and today I'm here with Pavi Maris. Uh, Pavi is a full time trader and full time engineer. I met Pavi at the Ducks conference. Uh, I don't know, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Uh, seems like just yeah. yesterday, but um, yeah, we we uh we hit it off, and uh, you know he's he's a uh, He's got his, his stuff together. He's been around the markets for a bit. He's he's made over six figures, uh, verified on Kimfo. And um, I'm, I'm a fan of Kimfo, people on Kimfo. So I uh, decided- the website out there right now. Yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, we're, we're going to, we uh, I invited him on the podcast and yeah, he was excited to come on and here he is. So how you doing, Pavi? Hey, good, David. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you have a really good channel going on here. Tons of value and- uh, I'm uh, glad to be on here to share my story as well. Awesome, man! Thanks. Yeah, the the I, I saw a, a a niche in the trading space of having like quality content from like traders that are that are, are that are focused on improving every day, not just beginner traders. There's, there's a lot of stuff for noobs. But what about the right. trader that wants to get to the next level? You know, that's why we go to these conferences like Ducks and stuff sure. like that. So I, know, it, I must say, exactly, like uh, being part of a community is exactly how you can uh, be around a bunch of traders at the same time. You know, I've met a bunch of people online, but that was the first time since I started trading that I was around a whole bunch of people and I could just talk about trading like it was uh, like I'm talking about the weather, you know. That yeah, was really and, good. and it seems so I, I was an outsider coming into the Ducks conference, but uh, yeah, you, you're part of his Freedom Challenge and it seemed like you guys yeah. had a whole group there. You guys were all friends. I think you guys right. all met for the first time in person, yes. but um, but yeah, it seemed like you guys got a nice, nice community there. Yeah, um, exactly. So the, the conference itself, it seemed like most of them were newbies. Not everybody was part of the Freedom Challenge, but there was a group of people who did know each other really well. Um, like people I've known for the last two years, actually since uh, early 2020 and uh, it's the first time to uh, like I've talked with them over voice chat and uh, friends with them on social media but that's about it you know but when you really hang out is when you can really exchange ideas and actually get to know the person and who they are and stuff and that goes along with, that goes on to inform a lot of the the subconscious uh, motivations behind them and then you can pick up on certain cues which you otherwise wouldn't be if you're doing it just meeting them online that's that's a great point. And I'll, I'll tell you what, that's been one of uh, the things that I focused on this year and last year. Uh, I don't know. I, I was in the trade space in Puerto Rico. It's like an office. Mm -hmm. And you got I got to network and make friends with other traders and see their personalities. Like you see the underlying, like what they're right. in the market for, you know, and then you can kind of. Yeah, it's it's a cool it's cool to have that human element in there you know what i mean uh totally because uh, uh just sitting behind trading can be a or it is a very solitary thing even though you are interacting with thousands of people uh like buying and selling shares um it is very solitary and it's nice to have that kind of personal touch every once in a while yeah absolutely so pavi okay so let's get let's go in the background over here so okay. you want to give the audience maybe a background of uh of yourself and also like when you started trading and how you ended up in the ducks challenge and when you started to become profitable just like a whole background yeah yeah okay so uh i'm actually from india i've been in the u.s for about six and a half seven years now uh came here to do my master's and then uh um i was gunning for my dream job as an engineer in uh, research and development uh which i did achieve and for the first time in my life, I was going to have money in my pocket, you know, significant money. So I had to learn to be smart with how I'm going to use it, how I'm going to grow it, and, how, and if I'm going to save it for the future as well. Um, so 2017 was when I started off in my career. And then um, so slowly I was looking into things on like, okay, what can I do with this? You know, like I was uh, paying back my student loans and... Uh, then one day I did, I come across, I came across a video uh, in the summer of 2017 by uh, Sykes, actually, like he was talking about, uh, it was one of his quintessential videos where he's like, he has this Lamborghini and the jet in the background. He's like, you got to study. If you study, you can have the life that I have or something like that. And it's like, study, like study what? Um, and then I saw penny stocks and then like penny stocks. Okay. So that's like some Wolf of Wall Street stuff, you know, like that's, that's where the mind imme immediately goes to because I had never touched anything in the stock market before that. So um, looking into his stuff and uh, what he's talking about, I learned the basics on, I mean, what is a stock? I mean, well, how do you buy and sell? 
um, and just uh, I learned about short selling, but I never short sold for about two years after. Um, so that's how I got started with the stock market. I, I joined this, uh, this group and slowly uh, doing that, but, but learned the basics and then learned from the community at large, from this chat room as well, and the other people in it, which I believe you were probably at some point you were in it, I guess. Yeah, 2017. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. I was there. Yeah. Um, I was a complete newbie back then. And uh, in 2019, I did get more into it and try to be more regular with my trading because st I'm still a full-time engineer. So I'm working in the afternoons. I'm on the West Coast here. So I go to my work in the uh, afternoon and in the morning from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. I'm in the market. So... Um, Although I, I wasn't profitable, like I blew up a couple of uh, accounts, like one was $6,000 and the other was uh, $4,000, I mean, I think. And uh, yeah, so at my lowest point, my equity curve, I was at negative 10K or so, not including the, the tuition for education and other stuff. Um, but it was like a boom and bust cycle. Like I would make some, but I would lose it because the market just changes so quickly, right? Uh, late 2019 was when I decided, okay, I need to learn, look into the short selling stuff because I've been scared away into not touching it at all. So I uh, looked into uh, Stephen Duck's stuff and uh, his patterns and what he's talking about. And that's what made me profitable. Like, so I switched brokers, uh, being able to short sell small caps. And uh, since then it's been like, it was like, I, it took me about a month for me to like, get a little comfortable with short selling and uh, like be able to change my bias on the stock when it's, when the move is done and, you know, go short. So, so since then it's been profitable. So uh, I'm up 200 K now. Um, as, nice. uh, Sean Kidfo. Great. Okay. So Pavi, I have a couple questions. So I started around the time you did, and actually I came from graduate school into trading just like you did pretty, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Now, Okay, so you you started as an engineer. You had some some income now, uh, some money for the first time. Yes. And um, so, what made you? Because a lot of people, when they get money, they just want to start, go the safe route, especially if, if you're coming from graduate school and stuff. Just invest it. Now, right. what made you want to like? Okay, I need to learn trading. I think I can do this. This is uh, this yeah. is for me. What made you have the confidence to uh, invest in a course to teach you how to trade? Right. Um. That's, that's such a good question because uh, I could never see myself. I mean, if you had told me, say, 10 years ago that one day you'd be spending, say, thousands of dollars on learning how to trade stocks and stuff, just that concept of spending that much money to learn something from some person on YouTube or, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a bit of an outlandish concept. I mean, even I, well, I spent $40,000 on my master's degree. But um, so I do know the value of I understand the value of education and it, it was a, it's a required investment. But I'd like to answer your question more of a personal way, which is uh, uh, coming from. Uh, well, I love my job, but um, I can't be in the job for thirty five years. I do not envy my my superiors, my, my, like my man like high level managers and stuff. I do not envy their job. I love what I do, but to be able to establish a sense of uh, uh, freedom with how I can spend my time. And uh, that was a huge motivator for me uh, being uh, here in the US and like having reached a big goal of mine. I mean, it is my dream job, but now it's like, then what, you know, like, gonna, like I guess like some people maybe have that little bit of inner um, drive, you could call it, I guess, to, uh, yeah, to go to the next step and see what's, what's possible. So, so when you had that drawdown, you still always had that drive and that confidence, like, okay, I got to figure this, just like engineering. Yeah. Uh, Cause I know like ducks came from an engineering background as well. So I know yes. like I, I'm an architecture background. So I know like engineers, they like to solve the problem. So like you saw the the problem there and you're just attempting to solve it constantly and you, you, you had the confidence to figure it yeah. out. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it definitely was not also like a constant journey. There would be times in between where, um, you know, I, I, so I have to manage my job while I'm doing this as well. So not being able to wake up at, say, 5.30 a.m. to be there for the pre-market and stuff like that. So, yes, like even through all those uh, boom and bust cycles, um, it was definitely like, of course, there were times when I get 
demotivated. Like I remember the first few times when I, like I would wake up and I had like a $6,000 account. And then I, um, let's say I lose a hundred dollars by in the first 20 minutes of market open. I'm like, okay, what do I do now? Like, and I would be a little dejected and I'd need <laughs> uh, the whole day or like the next couple of days to uh, digest that, uh, say like emotionally a little bit. And uh, actually there is one thing which I can, uh, one important point. So one thing which I did back then was I, like I was under PDT. So people generally say, okay, like if you're under PDT, just stick to the, the basic like proven patterns, like, okay, you buy the first green day and it'll gap up the next day, or maybe on an OTC stock or something like that. So, um, I did try those things, but without like a direct one-on-one -on -one guidance, it was tough to do anything like that. I mean, I would try something, but I don't know if something is support or resistance. I mean, I know what support and resistance is, but if it just broke something called support, then wait, was that not support, right? So I needed to, I needed a lot of data samples of my own experience losing and winning to, to like, to establish in my own mind that I know like, okay, I'm to, to take in the lessons. So what I did was I actually went to a bank and I borrowed $25,000 and I just let it sit in my trading account. I didn't trade with it but I just let it sit there and I was paying interest on it and I was repaying it with my, um, my salary. Uh, so, yeah. So that is something that I did to be able to uh, quickly like make mistakes and learn. That's discipline right there. So you, you took that out and you just, you had it there, but you know, you didn't, you could, you know, you couldn't really trade the way you need yeah. to trade with that money, but you used yes. it to learn. Very like, interesting. That's, that's a, it shows the, the discipline you have. And I, I guess, you know, with the engineering background and with um, success in, in your career early on, you understand that discipline, what it takes to do something the right way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I would say just to touch back on what you mentioned about education. I think education is really important, regardless of which uh, field we're in. Education and mentorship, um, like how else does one, one learn, right? Um, there could be certain things where, um, like most fields like require to, to, to reach a level of mastery, you would have to like spend all those hours and you know, like go to the, the fundamental granular level of each and every single concept. Um, so coming, as you said, coming from that, having already excelled in a certain field, those skills are definitely transferable. Um, like I was watching your um, podcast with Ali Angel uh, just a couple of days ago. And uh, one of the things that she said is, okay, you got to be teachable. So that yeah. being teachable is an important characteristic of somebody who is smart or wants to be smart. And I'm not talking IQ or anything like that, but it's just that kind of being able to take in a lesson and accept. So even like being able to accept a loss and say, and not blame it on something. Oh, like, oh, those guys, like the market maker did it or you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like an important lesson, I, I would say. Man, that's very good that you picked that up. Uh, that's one of the things outside of the podcast that we discussed to put it in there. And we're like, okay, we're going to, when are we going to discuss being teachable? Should, then it's like, we're going to put it at the end, but like how many people are going to stick around to the end? And I, I was like, okay, so let's, let's sprinkle it all throughout because this is, she, yeah. she, she really stresses on being teachable. Um, right. And that, I think that was such a high value podcast. I'm going to, yeah, I'm probably going to join her group. It's it's um yeah the stuff that she puts out is everything is is incredible I I don't understand yeah. like how yeah more people need to to, to look into it. if you really if you really want to know markets especially with fundamentals fundamentals is such a boring topic yeah, <laughs> you know right and it makes it uh really relatable but anyway I, I I totally agree with education man I spent a lot of time in school myself with a bachelor's master's mm -hmm. et, whatever and um. Yeah, you know, it's just all those lessons that it takes to 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 achieve something like getting a degree and a high level and understanding concepts and researching. Yeah. It's it's uh it works with this and and uh the way you right. went about the markets uh early on it it shows that you know it was yeah. it, it came from something like that. True, dude. Like I mean, when you sit for uh, three hours trying to understand what a partial differential equation is or some other complex concept in architecture let's say even though you might not use it ever again in your life the fact that you had to sit there 
and get through a tough concept in your own brain, that was the real skill that was learned, which is transferable across uh, various disciplines. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Well said. Okay, so um, you mentioned, uh, okay, so how would you describe yourself as a trader? Like systematic, discretionary, both uh, like, and how what how did you um how did learning from ducks and learning from others uh yeah. like affect you with uh this, you know being the trader you are right okay so uh when it comes to data so I did data collectively with a bunch of uh, friends that I met uh, from these chat rooms and uh, as data the data that we have is used to inform what stocks I should even be in as far as Entries and exits are concerned, I would say that's a little bit discretionary with a little bit of um, data informing it. So, for example, um, okay, should you be shorting GOVX today or should you be longing it, right? So, that's something which data can tell you based on, and it's not some complicated thing. It's a small, in small cap, you just look at past resistance days. And uh, this is something which you would learn when uh, you're in Dux's group or from his DVDs and stuff. Um, so yeah, so the data sort of informs what's, what stocks to trade and what not to touch. And then as far as my own specific thing is concerned, I would say I'm more of a very short term, like speculative scalper, I would say. My trades are typically within the range of like 15 to 20 minutes, I would say. 15 to 20 minutes and based off of data. So you've mixed, uh, um. Did you come up with the scalping strategies on your own? Because I know that Ducks doesn't scalp, for example. Yeah, he doesn't. And uh, I don't know many people um, that scalp. That Yeah, so like, how did you come up with the whole scalping uh, strategy based off data? So the data, uh, the, the, okay, the data informs which direction you're going to scalp. In. So for example, if there is... Um, so Ducks talks about one of his things, which is the bounce short pattern. So on the previous day, if there's a, a, like a huge candle uh, where it had a past spike with a lot of volume underneath it. And let's say today it's spiking into like a, the most consolidated area or so. So once it reaches there, it's going to start feeling that resistance from that day. Um, and he talks about, and it's not just he talks about, it's like, you're going to collect the data yourself and uh, look at, okay, what is the ratio of the of today's volume compared to that day's volume? And how much volume is in there in that, uh, was traded in, the, in that specific consolidation? So that is just going to inform, okay, I'm going to be short scalping it. Um, and I'll, then after that, it's just like a simple, like you just go off the key levels and then you pick an entry and then risk it. Um, in 2020 and 2021, I would say the markets are much more, like you could go both sides, I would say. I mean, you could you could ride the wave up to the top and then like short and like ride it back down. And then you like get out, go long, it'll go back and test the high, then you short it. Those kind of things were much more possible in 2020 and 2021. Uh, me currently, I'm trying to adapt by moving away from all that stuff because dip buying is not a good idea uh, at this point. And I have been uh, actually taking some loss, some significant loss actually uh, in those uh, things. And of course, like started to stay disciplined as well and not adding to the scalp and <laughs> just taking the loss. You know. Gotcha. And uh, so I saw a tweet today, actually, just a yeah. couple of hours ago by Ducks saying that the volume he he's he's so good with like uh, analyzing and tracking volume uh, yeah. all throughout, you know, and like coming up with this resistance levels like dollar block we can go over in a bit and like the volume forecasting and things like that but he made that tweet today about comparing volume this year to 2019 yeah what any any thoughts on that no that is true uh that's something which we talked about uh i think, I think at the conference where yes it is true that the the liquidity is just the volume is just so much lower in the small cap space and uh yeah and that does affect all the patterns and the, the most significant uh, factors that you learn from ducks are based on volume. Like volume analysis is his biggest thing, which uh, makes all of his patterns really successful, you know? So if you take his uh, three biggest patterns, uh, the gap up short, which is like, okay, when a stock gaps up over 50, uh, sorry, 70% uh, in a certain market cap range and it pushes 
the morning push and then it like fades back down. Some people might call it the gap and crap. Um, then there's the bounce shot, just like going into a pass resistance. And then there's the gap up plus bounce shot. And this, he has like success rates on all these different patterns. And, and these will change. The, the success rate of these patterns will change depending on what market we're in. Right. So some of them, there, there was a time when these patterns were not working at all. And uh, currently the market we're in, there are not as many bounce shorts anymore. So uh, the market is sort of like in a lull. There's something starting to move here and there. Like they say, like monkey box, oh, Sega is moving and GOBX is like having sympathy play. Um, I would say there are cycles when these happen and they don't happen. Um, yeah, so volume analysis should be like the number one, or if not the number one, um, it should be like way up there in anybody's analysis. So for example, if you might be a newbie trader who's like who wants to buy a breakout. Now, it doesn't mean just because if the breakout level is $2 and it went to 201, that's not a breakout. Right? So the, the volume is the one that informs, okay, is that a real breakout? Is it a fake out? And all those things. So I would say volume should be the number one factor in tracking data. Gotcha. And uh, so you mentioned the, okay, so the, the market's changing and the volume is, is, uh, is back to before. Now, um, as a trader that you've traded uh, in both markets, 2019 up to now and before that. Um, so in the past, I noticed like 2019, 2018, like when Ducks was uh, really starting to really get successful, yeah. it was short into previous resistance, um, you know, longer term resistance. And it would, that would work. And then 2020, 2021, volume was just so incredible it would chew through all that resistance and just keep going you know yeah. you'll see like days of a, a stock trades like a billion shares the b <laughs> or like you know yes. half a billion was like like normal right. you know remember srna the first time ever we saw like a 500 million share uh, volume day that was yeah it's insane crazy <laughs> half a billion uh, uh so what are your thoughts on that now are we reverting to that uh, like that's what it comes in handy uh being having the experience that you traded before the pandemic mania because now you understand because there's traders that have started their whole career uh 2020 2021 they can't even understand what it's like to like trade like uh, with a 2018 2019 volume um right um yes i would say in 2020 the patterns were still working uh 2021 was when it started getting I don't know, like some, I don't know, it's like algorithms or what's going on. Uh, well, I've heard a lot of different reasons, but I personally don't, I don't want to attribute any reason why, like, oh, this is because of an algorithm or this is because of X, Y, Z, you know, like there would be so many different factors, which we don't even know. I personally just look at the price and the volume and that's pretty much it. Um, I'd look at the news or what's up and like the SEC filings and to see like the list of SEC filings. I'm still not uh, I don't know much about SEC filings. I just know what they are and uh, what the different SEC filings are because I did um, look at uh, Michael Good and uh, Roland Wolf's stuff on SEC filings, but I never went into depth. But I would say that, yeah, the volume being back to those days, it's for somebody who has seen only the 2021 or the late 2020 market, um, the only way for them to like have an idea of how to trade in this market, considering the volume is back to back when it was 2018, 19, is to watch webinars or like whatever kind of educational material they can get their hands on from before then. Now that's still like a very sort of like a fluffy way of studying, but still at least like it, it sort of gives them an idea of like how, what to expect, I would say. But of course, the, the most important thing should just be to uh, like look at charts, screen time, and uh, track data. So by data, I mean things like, okay, like volume, like how much was the volume in the first 30 minutes of the day after the market opened? And what was the, uh, how much from the open price within the first 30 minutes and the first one hour, how much did the stock push before it started coming back down? And uh, at what time of the day was the high of the day reached? You no, know, like all these different, like simple um, heuristics which one can use to um, adapt to the changing markets. 
Now, I personally, I uh, mean, I'm saying all this stuff, but I personally have to hold myself accountable to do like do all this, and it can be a little tough to uh, um, like manage like with a full time career on the side. So, like, people have to that kind of time away, time in the markets after the uh, closing bell is sort of an important factor. I would say. For sure. Um, and OK, so the criteria that that uh, you guys use over there in the ducks or at least ducks that preaches yeah. um, like no low flows, no like sub two million flows or no. Um, like, for example, I, if something's rotating the float, it has to hit like or, you know, ideally it hits 20 times or more then it's bearish. So like how much of this stuff like is so easy to apply that you've learned from him? that is just part of your criteria now and how how like are are you like do you just not trade any sub two million flows because that's that's you know it's tempting no. sometimes and you see right. uh... <laughs> yeah no no i personally trade sub two million flows because i'm not an expert trader i'm uh, i'm just like a maybe above beginner slash maybe intermediate kind of trader but if i were truly a disciplined trader i would not be touching those sub two million flows because today i mean I, I touched pgy and i i was trying to short it based on some statistics of okay like if the stock has been consolidating at a certain level and if it's start squeezing what is the like an optimal pushing percentage before it tops out you know so maybe there's some statistic like that but the float is uh it's a very low float and uh yeah i mean i do try to go along on these two sometimes and uh also, sometimes short, and I, I mean, it's, that is the rule according to the Ducks stuff, but of course, like, that's, that's his, yeah. um, like, advice, but people do trade it all the time. Now, I have a question. Okay, so you're, you're, you're in the Ducks stuff all the time. So, like, with Ducks, he's made so much money now, and I, I, I you know, you look at his Kimfo, he's trading, like, uh, big name caps, like, like, Tesla, SPY, this and that, mm -hmm. um, and he's, he, he preaches about only trading a minimally, like uh, the, the criteria is so strict for him. Yeah. It has to be like over $6. You correct me if I'm wrong, over $6, uh, you know, it can't be sub 2 million float. It has to have this many, much volume. Yeah. He has market cap criteria as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, how much of that do you think is relevant, relevant? relative to his like the amount of money he's accumulated and and the amount of money he's trading because like if you're trading right. smaller accounts you got to build up to that capital because i i've yes. seen ducks over the years when he was in the chat the tim sykes chat when i was there i don't know if you were there too but uh no, I, I wasn't there at the time yeah no. but uh i remember i like i he wasn't trade i mean you it's just he's collecting the way i see it is he's collecting screen time at that time he's mm -hmm. he's collecting data he's going through the pain of like Everyone has to go, like I talked to Stonk Wonk uh, James yesterday, of a pod, yeah. great podcast. Right. The, everybody has to touch the stove a couple of times to, to get it. Yeah. So that was the period where Ducks was like touching the stove and figuring it out. Because we're all humans, right. we've got to figure it out. We Even don't know Ducks, much about that that period of his trading, do we? Um, I mean, I was I was there. I saw for a good a solid year Okay. Um, in the chat. I would I would talk with him in the chat and stuff like that. Uh, directly they used to allow the uh, messages in the chat you could type mm -hmm. and i remember we were both shorting a stock i was getting squeezed i had no i didn't really know that much but i knew ducks knew better than me so i would ask <laughs> hey what right. do you think you know i'm getting That's squeezed a fun time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i don't know if he remembers yeah. that but uh right. but yeah and then and then shortly after that they cut off direct messages because it mm -hmm. was like no, too many newbies were like question yeah. you know taking advantage but yeah. um but yeah, you know, it's just uh, so like you, you, the reason why I asked is because, OK, so you like you you, you scalp a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, you you, you, uh, you have it. So like you're not you're not trading like two trades a month. So like what what do you do? You, does How does that fit with uh, with your trading? Like do you like uh, when you're shorting a sub two million float stock or something that's uh less than two dollars or whatever it does yeah. that occur in your head like i shouldn't be doing this but i'm doing it this is the criteria is that maybe this is a c setup and you treat it you go right. about it that way yeah so i would say that the way uh all the kind of stocks that i do or the, even the kind of uh moves that i go for are not just the ducks ones uh but it's also just uh the, the other stuff that i've learned over the years from 
say like Ron Wolf and also Sykes stuff as well. I, I, I don't touch OTC stocks uh, anymore. Um, and definitely I would say liquidity is the most significant thing. Like I'm never in any illiquid stuff, but apart from that, if anything has a range, I'm all for trading it. Uh, and that's, and by the way, like that, maybe I should stop doing all that stuff. Um, and it would probably be best for me to do all those things, but that is something I'm still in the process of getting through all those things. And, uh, also still expanding my, my knowledge base of like, okay, like what are the different uh, people in the community I can learn from, you know? Um, so more recently I've started looking into, okay, algorithmic stuff from uh, Triforce and uh, just trying to develop that skill over the coming months and years as well. So, yeah, I would say uh, I'm still in the process of perfecting my, like what my, uh, go to like bread and butter is. I mean, I have some things which I've borrowed from people, but like I'd still like to uh, develop my own thing. I don't want to restrict myself only to ducks. I would say. Yeah, you know that's that's what's cool about about uh, trading. You can take things from different people yeah. and then come up with your own because everybody has like their own personality and exactly. what fits them. So yeah, that's and that's why it's 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 good to be like teachable, like we mentioned, and like open to things because like, it, it, you know. You you constantly can can pick things up that can apply to you directly. So, yes. yeah, that, it's it's good stuff. Um, now I yeah I saw you mention, or I saw you mentioned that you signed up for Triforce's thing. So what what is your what are you looking for with that? Because that, there's a lot of possibilities in the world of algorithms and auto trading. So yeah yeah what what's uh what are you what going into that world now? Because I think you just started. So yes. what now you have this whole universe just opened up to you. What what how how are you uh, thinking right. about going about it yeah um so triforce does a very specific type of trading like i think he does futures markets and uh i personally don't know anything about it yet i'm as i said like, i'm very new and i'm the main thing that i'm looking to learn from it is to be able to use uh python or any other programming language to inform my current trading uh activities you know? so being able to collect and go through like, tons of data in small cap would be an important skill that I would get from that, which I can start using right away, you know, uh, being able to find an edge in small cap right now, right? Um, at the moment, I'm not looking to make a computer trade for me automatically or anything like that, which he does go into, and that's a lot of his thing, I guess. I don't want to make too many comments about it, um, meaning, because I might say something that's inaccurate. Um, but because I I have I haven't even gone through his course yet. It's literally just a weekend, but that's one of my things going forward. But yeah, so just being able to use uh, data in a much more effective way, you know, because currently the data that uh, I've done is like spreadsheets, looking at um, like well, me myself going through the data and like maybe maybe like sorting stuff or like just basic Excel stuff, but to be able to uh, find an edge by in in like a huge spreadsheet of data using Python or like basic data analysis is, uh, would be like my say like six month kind of goal, I would say. Cause I still need to spend time on it and trading and my job and everything. And in fact, I have a book right here, uh, which was recommended by- Python. Some, yeah. uh, for data analysis. Big book. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that should be fun <laughs> to uh, get through, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so data. All right. So you want to break down how you go about the process of collecting data and like, when do you reach like an aha moment when you're collecting data or an idea for a potential, yeah. you know, collecting data? Right. For me, it's, it's very quick. Um, it's like, I don't need like 200 samples to tell me, oh, this works for me to start trying it. And uh, I don't know, that's not something which one would do say if they're part of a hedge fund or something, but for something, for somebody who's like a retail trader with a small account, I would say like simple heuristics. So if you see that something works, like say 60% of the time, do it. Like that's sort of my philosophy of doing it. Like also, and it's, a, it's something which I sort of even adopted from my career as an engineer. Because in engineering, you don't care exactly why works, why something works or so. Like you just want to solve the problem. Like you want to 
make the number, okay, you like reducing, I mean, I don't want to not to diminish what we do, but okay, if you buy a stock, the most important factor is that the stock should go up with the volume. Like that's the most important thing. So cutting out all the excess variables would be my biggest thing. So just focusing on the one or two variables and for that is volume. So just focusing on that and seeing, okay, so let's say if a stock gaps up uh, 50%, are the odds different? Are the odds that it'll close lower than the open price different than it gaps up 70% or 80%? And this is something, it's not something which I came up with or anything, but just seeing that, okay, if it's close to 50%, that's that by itself could be, if you have good position sizing and risk management, that by itself could be an edge that you can use. So for me, it doesn't take too much to, uh, to, to have conviction in uh, the trade. Cause I am in and out very quickly. I'm not just staying in it. Like I am out really quickly if it doesn't work out. So the, 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 t- the short amount of time it's like a risk averse strategy for those lower odds plays, but it, you know, and uh, your position sizing as well. So the more it's, confidence you have in the trade, the higher, the bigger yeah. the position size. Right. And, and yeah. And then, so how do you focus on like the thesis of, of going into a trade to let it, pl- let's say, um, a stock is up a lot and like you, it has a, you know, it has a good chunk to give, you know, the risk reward is there, but, mm-hmm. um, how do you differentiate wh- how much time to stay in it, to give it time to play out, to, to really crack if you on the, on the short side, especially. Right. So that's where I would say, um, just reading the tape and level two, like, let's say, uh, let's say the stock has a resistance at 2.2 and you short at two, it comes down to like 1.7. And uh, the 1.7 was a previously consolidated area. So just seeing how is it, the, the way it bounces and stuff. This is something which, uh, I mean, people can watch like a whole bunch of uh, level two and tape reading type of videos to understand. And it's also a lot of intuition that's going in, into it, um, which sort of makes it a little sort of scientific, but that is sort of what discretionary trading is, I guess. Gotcha. And okay, so now you mentioned that like, uh... Okay, the bounce shorts earlier that was really prevalent in 2020, late 2020, 2021, I believe. Um, yeah. was that, is that something that you're kind of referring to right now? Like like a, a bounce setup? You're yes. reading the level two. And uh, yeah, you you wanna what what is the bounce short like to you? A stock gapping up and uh spiking into previously consolidated volume. I see. And, uh, and so these days they're happening less, you mentioned also. Yes, right? currently we don't have these, like, I mean, we, we do have some of these, uh, we don't have those every day. I mean, like, so what I'm saying was that in 2020 and 2021, we, we would have these bond shorts all the time. Yeah, the, uh, there was one um, trader in the Freedom Challenge. I think he made a, a lot of money on that. He was one of the speakers. Right. You just would bounce right. short every day. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. in 2021, so if you remember, early 2021 was all, when all those crazy GME, AMC, and other stocks happened, right? So when all that volume was stuck above, for the rest of 2021, there were so many opportunities with those stocks like spiking back up into those levels. So that's that is the bounce short. I see. Yeah, I remember seeing that. I was actually yeah. starting out in 2020, around that time. And I saw a lot of people shorting those. It was too volatile for me. But um, yeah. were were you in the in the Ducks Freedom Challenge at that time? Yes, yeah, I so- wasn't that active though. No. I mean, I was mostly in twenty twenty, and uh, yeah, we sort of I stopped being in the chat too much, mainly because we uh, um, I sort of created a separate one, like a little unofficial one, where we would do voice chatting all the time. Um, like try to get ducks and uh, some of his admins to create a voice chatting group and they just ignored me. So uh, a bunch of us just would be like in the pre-market from from pre-market till market close. We'd just be like in the voice chat, just talking about stuff and just learning from each other and just having fun too. Like just like, there's not much to to do. People would be like, maybe you would play songs and start singing or just like cracking jokes and stuff. Uh, Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I've seen... um... Some of your stuff on social media, you have like a group Zooms with the people from there. Is that <laughs> yeah. is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Zoom thing was like our first meeting. It was like a Christmas meeting. But um, 
on on a day to day basis we would be like in the voice chat like talking about oh like let's start like let's get borrows and like let's short it i mean we we're all like sort of none of us are, we don't want to claim like to be like experts or anything like that we're just all like uh, i would say above beginner we all had success a little bit but trying to be consistently profitable like in the long run i mean even myself i would say like i mean it's only been 2 years and 2020 and 2021 2021 was a little bit tougher but i would say i mean i can i don't want to claim to be like a profitable trader so like i mean if you if you take the last 2 years okay i can say i'm profitable but what if in the next year like i'm just back down to zero right? like anything can happen so yeah um yeah so that is something which uh, i would say some i'm always aware of to uh, just like have a mind yeah uh the last podcast as well james was saying um stock wonk uh was saying yeah it's not about how much money you make how much money you keep and then also moving forward to be consistent to stay consistent and adapt yeah. um so about the tools you use i remember in the, uh, i think or you guys use ortex to track all the short data is that is that uh is that what you guys use no uh it was just spreadsheets just looking at charts and gathering the numbers from there gotcha so um and how do you how do you plan on sizing up depending on the data do you have like a like i know there's a book called the kelly criterion i don't know if you know about it like uh you know sizing up accordingly to like risk reward or or yeah. just doing that discretionary me personally i just have my own uh way of doing it which is i just want to maintain it typically my my long setups i would do just um and by long setup i mean this is just one thing which is like a low float long dip by on the first green day um like i would do a maximum of about 20% of my account and then for a pattern like a bounce short i would go as much up to like 50% of my account which is not that much like um i always don't have all my money in the account i just have like like 35 to maybe like 50% of my trading capital in the account gotcha and uh, okay so to start to wrap it up now so um what is your favorite ideal setup overall um <laughs> so i i would say if i were to be sensible i should say the gap up plus bounce short but i also do a lot of try a lot of like long setups which do not work <laughs> so that's something that i'm trying to work on but i would say um the gap up plus bounce short like where stock gaps up and gap it's gapping up into prior heavy resistance from a couple of weeks ago or maybe even a month ago gotcha so you like the time frame of a uh, recent resistance yes yeah definitely the re- the resistance has to be recent um like beyond a certain while it sort of gets invalidated yeah ducks mentioned uh after more than 6 months he, he doesn't really look at it as 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 much yeah that was true. one one takeaway um and um what's your most memorable trade BYFC my uh, first ever uh um, five figure day this was 2020 that's the banks right uh yeah 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 that was a bank play and uh yeah it was like a people treated us as, as like a regular gap up short and that was a time when things are going crazy like they would things would just come back out of the blue and uh so yeah i did short it initially then i went long rode up i always take prof i always like so position sizing and risk management are one of my favorite things i think there's a huge edge in just how you do those things so the way you take profits for example so i always take profits into spikes and uh then just shot it right at the top i mean there's like th- you can crack statistics on if something is starting to squeeze let's say in a certain float range let's say like 3 million to 6 million float um and you can have your own own ranges you can think about it, or you, one thing you can track is what is the average squeezing percentage of like a stock which, which is in a certain market cap you know so so you can write it up and then once it's maxed out and typically you can also track like at what point of the day it maxes out and then uh you take like a, a you put out a feeler short and then like if it like collapses a little bit and forms like a nice like i also use like really simple things like okay if the 15 minute candle closes uh red but the 30 minute candle is still green like no that's going to attract some shorts so like i 
try to think about those things. I'm trying to cut those out a little bit because it's a little too much to think about. And then like just write it all the way back down. So I would say that was my favorite trade um, still to this day. And to be able to see like, oh, I'm up 12 grand um, in <laughs> like, you know, a couple of hours or so um, is was sort of surreal, I would say. That's awesome, man. Um, and where do you see yourself in the future with trading? Um, I see myself just, um, ideally I want to see myself cut out all the bullshit trades that I do. And that's enough for me. I don't need to make any more money. Like I don't need to size up, uh, just work on my own internal disciplines, my mental discipline to, um, just, uh, and let it reflect in the market. So trying to see trading as also like a, a reflection of my own internal process uh, in my own mind. Absolutely, man. That's cool. Um, okay. So, and any book recommendations? Uh, no, like about trading. Yeah. Yeah. The, as far as trading is concerned, I just have one book, which I've ever listened to. Um, it's just that the famous book trading in the zone. Oh, it really did. Yeah. It really did um, help me see, like for example, things like, um, like not taking profits, taking partial profits was yeah. something which I started doing just because I listened to that book. Uh, in 2019, I listened to that book about 20 times. I would say. 20 times. Yeah, yeah. yeah I I listened to it a few times as well. Um, I don't know about 20 times, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So you have it on audio. Yes, audiobook. Yeah, so with audio, you can do that. Yeah, it's yeah. a good book. Um, definitely. So, so uh, Pavi, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast, man. Um, we're gonna keep in touch, and uh, yeah, great to have you on. Yeah, for sure, David. Thank you very much.